there. Okay. Um, so this is uh, just, just to give you a, a sense of what we want to try to cover, what I want to try and cover this evening. Um, inevitably, these talks um, tend uh, to, to be really, really overview in nature. Um, uh, insulation sounds about so, so, sounds to be about one of the most boring things one could possibly talk about, um, but it's actually one of the most important, and there's a very wide range of implications um, associated with the choices you make, um, not just for how your building will perform in terms of heat, but various other things besides. Um, so I'm going to touch on that. I'm going to introduce um, the sort of context for, for the conversation this evening, really. Um, by helping, helping us to, to just briefly look at um, the UK emissions context, um, regulatory frameworks in terms of how, how insulation and building comfort is, is regulated or, or not regulated in the UK. Um, I'm then gonna talk about um, what makes an energy efficient building um, and a little bit about unintended consequences as well as intended consequences. I'm gonna to touch briefly on nuts and bolts <clears throat> what I mean by that is, what do the various insulation elements in a building look like? Um, a few questions, or a few, yeah, sorry, a few, a few, um, a few sort of sketch drawings, a few uh, photographs to show you there of various kinds of insulation solutions, um, and then hopefully we'll wrap up with some Q and A. Um, hopefully, this will leave everybody um, at least ten minutes. Um, if I could rely on. Uh, Cara and Mary to just give me a bit of a heads up if I'm heading beyond 20 minutes with my, my section. Um, so moving on, um, this is probably very familiar to all of you. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, it's a very basic picture for what the UK greenhouse gas emissions are at the moment. So we're looking at around about 30% um, of UK average uh, emissions coming from the, the home stroke residential sector. Um, in, in London, um, because of the fact that we're so predominantly a, a, a non-industrial city, um, we, we have probably more like 55 to 65 percent of, of emissions in London are accounted for by, uh, by residential um, uh, heat and, and, and the energy used in buildings. Um, so I'm going to just scoot on to this one to talk a little bit about context. And I'm, I'm deliberately doing this backwards because when we look at a building, um, we have to look at the energy performance in the round. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about the passive house standard at the moment. And I'd like you to just think for a moment, um, if you will, of your credit card. Um, I'm sure you, you've all got plenty of plastic in your wallet. You just think about that in the context of your overall building uh, envelope. Um, and just think about that. Think about it as maybe one third of one brick. Um, and I, I'm going to just put this into context just, uh, just now. Um, most of our homes are built at the moment to standards set out in the building regulations. These lovely documents here, part L of the building regs. These govern the way in which your building is built and how it should perform uh, in respect of energy uh, efficiency. So what there are, and there are two things that, that, that these regulations primarily govern. One is air tightness and one is energy efficiency. And of course, there's a relationship between the two. Um, and I wanted to just put this in context for, for all of us who look at new buildings. And this is just setting the scene for the challenge we have in our existing building stock, which is you know, about 90% of the building stock we will have um, come 2050. Um, so at the moment, building regulations allow builders to build new homes for you and for me with a hole in them equivalent to 400 millimeters square, 40 centimeters square. Now, if you think about that in the context of the, the, the piece of information at the bottom of the screen, the passive house standard, when you build a building to passive house standards, you're allowed to have one credit card sized hole in your building. So what, what does this mean? This means, if you look at the red in the middle, that new build homes are legally buildable today in such a way as allows all the heat 
that you, you pay good money to put into your home to be lost every six minutes if the external air temperature or air, air uh, pressure is, is 20 miles an hour. So if you just think about that, it sets the scene for why we've got such a big challenge. You know, we're essentially going to be retrofitting not just all those old Edwardian and Victorian homes we're living in at the moment, or many of us are living in there um, today, but we're also going to be retrofitting the new build homes that are being built today. Um, so it's it's a huge challenge, um, and and I, you know, in setting that in context, we have 27 million homes in the UK at the moment that need retrofit, but we keep building, and we keep building to standards that are going to require that retrofit. So what does it look like in terms of our energy at the moment? In, an, in a typical UK home, um, space heating, and that's the big take home here, is about 60-65% 60, of the energy demand. And of that, if you look to the smaller graph at the side or the pie chart at the side, you'll see roughly what happens with the heat loss in the building. So the big the big, the big um, pie chart on the left talks about how we use energy, energy in our buildings. And the smaller one then talks about that 66% and how the energy is lost in a building. Um, so you can see that um, your roofs, uh, you can see all the various percentage there, um, which indicates when we tackle the building, what areas we need to prioritize. Um, so if I move on, this is another way of looking at similar information, slightly different percentages, but it just helps you to see it more graphically, perhaps, in terms of your house. And, you know, here you see indications of about 25% of heat loss going through your roof, about 30, 35% through your walls, windows 18 to 20%, and then various other elements making the balance. Um, and what that means today is that the average home uses about 250 kilowatt hours per square meter per year per annum of energy. Um, so, and, and if we refer back to what I was talking about earlier, the part L um, of the building regulations, they stipulate um, that we should be doing 60% better than that by, by, by forcing builders to build in such a way as delivers 100 kilowatt hours Per, per square meter per year. And then just again, to put this in context, the standard we need to be building to is the passive house standard. And for passive house, you need to be delivering in and around 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So, you know, again, just setting the context for, for the, 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 the sort of mammoth task we have ahead. So moving on to insulation. Um, so, the funny thing about insulation is that it has lots and lots and lots of different functions in a given, in a given building. Um, so it, it delivers lots of different uh, benefits. Um, and, you know, we need to think about these things when we choose the insulation solution that we, 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 for our building. So yes, clearly it's helping primarily to reduce heat loss. It's reducing the speed at which heat loses your building. Or, or is lost through your building. Um, but it also has, um, you know, a lot of different things to do with heat gain. Um, so if you choose the right insulation, you'll also be choosing a product that will minimize the speed at which heat is, is entering your building in summer, for example, when you've got peak uh, 30 degree temperatures or, or even, you know, 35, 36 degree temperatures. And this is an increasing challenge we're all facing with, with global warming. Um, we need our buildings to not just work in winter, we need them to work in summer. And that means choosing carefully um, the products that you use. Um, the information that I've got on the right-hand side here is really just a, a very quick uh, pointer um, to, for example, um, the products that can be used in windows. Um, we talk about insulation, but I, I would prefer to talk about this in terms of the, the total thermal envelope of the building, which necessarily includes your windows and your doors as per that, that energy savings trust graph you saw earlier. Um, and it's, you know, it's worth bearing in mind when you're choosing windows, you, you can buy a plastic window 
for, I don't know, 30% or 40% of the price of a timber window. But it necessarily performs much less well um, because heat passes through plastic um, much faster than it does through timber, for example. So the various bits and pieces of information I have in here about um, the, 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 per, the thermal performance of different building materials is really important. I'm, I'm not expecting everybody to understand these things. I'm just trying to raise, um, raise the point so you're aware of the fact that, that the materials you choose, um, which may be the ones that are suggested and, and foisted upon you by a given salesperson, are not always the right ones to choose. And it really does, um, it does warrant uh, thinking and asking more questions uh, before you choose any solution that you wish to, to, to use. Um, and one of the other things that's really crucial when we think about building materials is the, the health issues. Um, so there are lots of papers that have been written um, about what's called sick building syndrome, um, which has got something to do with the potential um, for the, the properties of certain materials to create unpleasant environments. Um, and, and there's a certain toxicity that, that is involved. And, you know, of course, we've seen these with, with uh, you know, the, the, the tragedy of Grenfell and, and, and various other fires that have happened, you know, where people are, um, don't necessarily die from the heat of a, of, of, of a fire, but they die, they're consumed by the fumes from a fire, the toxic chemicals that are contained in the building elements. So I would suggest that choice of material um, is very important because not just for, for, for safety, but for acoustic properties. And as I mentioned earlier, for summertime overheating issues. Um, so, and, and you know, there's all, also the wider, wider uh, environmental impact of the materials that are chosen um, and insulation materials are 80 to 90% of them in the UK are petrochemically derived products. And they have lots of negative and nasty environmental impacts um, associated with their production and with their end of life um, treatment. Um, so again, more things to bear in mind. Um, overheating is, is one of the biggest challenges we're starting to face. Um, it's less of an issue, it has been less of an issue here, but in other parts of the world, um, you know, air conditioning and the need to cool homes actively rather than passively um, has been a huge issue um, and is becoming an ever bigger issue. Um, the last thing we need to be doing in the UK is building a need for cooling equipment in buildings. Um, and it is, it is very possible to address this through careful use of building materials. Um, so, Moving on again um, into the nuts and bolts side of things, um, kind of galloping through, but just want to give you some visual ideas of some of the solutions and some of the barriers that are faced when, when people look at insulation. So, you know, the simplest and, and least expensive thing you do in a building is normally your loft insulation. And loft insulation, um, typically people complain about the fact that they can't. Um, that they, they don't have enough room for, for, for storing um, goods, the, 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 the things they don't really need in the first place, but, but we all want to or need to keep, um, need to go in a loft. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you see on the right-hand side of the, the, the left picture here, you see a, a sheep's wool insulant, um, which is about 300, about 400 mil um, thick here. So it sits in between the, the, the ceiling joists and above. But you also see in the, in the background of the, of the photograph, you see insulation platforms that have been, been built using rigid wood fiber insulation in this case. So the same sort of insulation value can be achieved um, by using different kinds of materials in different ways to get over the need for continuing to use your loft as a storage space. Um, the, the, the other thing that classically is a problem is pitched roofs um, where you've got to insulate under the rafters. Um, and, and that's also possible, as you can see in these applications here, where um, ventilation is, is key. Ventilation is maintained in the, in the void um, on, between the slates or the, the tiles. 
and the insulation layer because you've got to have a continuous run of insulation from your eaves to your, um, your, your well, I guess from your soffit um, and, and gutter boards all the way up to the apex of the roof. Um, so it's really important again that you don't just stick insulation right up against the underside of your, your roof. Um, and it can be done the right hand side here you see is insulation on the inside of an already plastered ceiling. Um, that can also be done. Um, so lots of solutions are possible and don't let anybody tell you, oh, we can't do that. It just generally means they don't want to do it because it's a little bit too much trouble for them. But solutions are available. Um, just a little bit of careful thinking and, and, and primarily remembering that your, your room or, or your loft or your roof space needs to breathe. And it's a really important concept in, in buildings, um, which I'll come back to in a moment or may come back to in Q&A, in fact. Um, so this is a schematic of, of, of floors. So you, we, we've talked about roofs and um, floors um, can be delivered in lots of different ways. Um, if you're lucky enough to have crawl space beneath your floors, you can insulate from the underside and you'll see a photograph in a moment of just such an application. Um, if you don't have that option, um, it's quite an arduous task. You essentially need to empty the room, you need to lift the floorboards, and you need to do something like this, whereby you, you, you have a carrier membrane, which kind of runs in between the joists and carries this insulation layer. Um, and then you put an air tightness membrane, which is the green membrane, all the way across the floor. So you're dealing not just with the heat loss, but you're also dealing with the, the admission of unwanted ventilation drafts through the floor. And then you put your floorboards back on top, uh, however they may be. This is just you know, one representation of how the floorboards may be. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very invasive process, clearly, and not a cheap process to go through. Um, but again, um, makes huge improvements um, to, to the performance of, of your space and the comfort. Your comfort in your, in your room makes a huge difference when you've done your floor properly. Um, so moving on, um, so this is the picture that I was referring to earlier, which looks at um, how you might apply insulation to the underside if you've got a decent crawl space. Um, so not an awful lot to say with that. Uh, you, you fill the voids. Um, you make sure that there is ventilation underneath this void again. And you've got to be able to continue to allow a continuous flow of air beneath your floor. And in all parts of your building, that has to be a controlled element when you insulate. Um, so this is a, a, a moving on to walls. This is an external wall insulation project in, in sort of mid, uh, mid flow, where this is a wood fiber based insulation system, which has been applied to the exterior of, in this particular case, um, a, a cavity wall building, which already had the cavity insulated. Um, but this was an effort to get down to passive house standards with triple glazing and, uh, and a very high performing, performing insulant on top of an already insulated cavity. And again, one of, the, one of the things I keep talking about is breathability and vapor transfer in buildings. Because this is a, an, a, a, a wood fiber solution, which then was rendered with a lime based render, the building continued to breathe nicely with more, any moisture continue, any moisture being built up on the inside, allowing, um, being allowed to pass to the outside. Um, again, this is another example with an eaves area where you can see the, the tiles and the slates had to be run over the insulation and battened out. Um, and then that particular bit that you see now um, kind of looked like that when it was finished, a rendered finish behind those new uh, boards and the new run of slates, which you see on top. Um, uh, just to, to point out for anybody who is looking at external wall insulation, it's, it's a great thing to do. It makes an enormous difference, but it is not an easy thing to do. Um, there's a reason why external wall insulation and indeed internal wall insulation doesn't get done as often as it should do. And that's because there's lots of challenges. Um, so what you see here, is a survey I did years ago for Harringay Council where we were looking at the challenges of certain buildings. And you can see essentially enormous amounts of pipe work and duct work coming out of, of various walls on various properties, which all had to be rerouted at significant additional expense um, once the insulation layer went, 
went on top of them. Um, so again, these are things you have to look out for and often they're not costed or they're costed as a, as a by the way, um, you do realize we didn't include that in our costing, you know, and you suddenly wind up with several thousand pounds of extra costs because rainwater pipes, down water, down, down pipes, uh, you know, soil and waste pipes all have to be rerun to connect to perhaps a new, a new chamber in the ground. Um, so all these things need to be thought about. And if you do um, embark upon um, an external wall insulation project, you really need to ask the questions and make sure that everything is included. Otherwise you get some nasty shocks. Um, Dermot, Dermot, about um, two or three minutes left. Fantastic, okay, thank you. So um, I'm almost, I think I've got one or two slides and that's it. Yeah, so this is internal wall insulation and the right hand photo, photo shows um, two stages of, of a process. Um, so you see here a, a curved or, or, yeah, eventually a curved bay um, where internal wall insulation was applied much like the right hand uh, side of the photograph and then skimmed over again with a breathable, um, I think in this case, it was a lime based plaster. Um, on the right hand side, you see the stage or the, the stage which preceded that. Um, so in this case, being applied to a party wall to deliver acoustic as well as thermal benefits because the next door neighbors were particularly noisy. Um, the right hand photograph is a similar sort of thing. And here you're seeing, you see all this membrane underneath the tongue and groove timber. That is an air tightness membrane with air tightness tapes um, set behind the insulation, sorry, in front of the insulation layer. So this is, um, yeah, two, two examples of that. Let me move on to final slides. Um, so, so these are a couple of thermal images of some buildings which I was involved with um, many moons ago. Um, the left-hand photograph um, looks at a house which had, had already had energy efficiency work carried out to it. Those of you who are familiar with these photographs will know that the the sort of brighter or more orange um, uh, sort of colors in the photographs represent heat loss. Um, the warmest possible colors equals the greatest amount of heat being lost through the building fabric. The right hand side was a fully retrofitted building, which I, was, I, I delivered many moons ago again. Um, and you see the big difference between the two, just looking at the front door where it says SP5 4.9, and SP4 6.5, you see the average differences between a well insulated, well installed, triple glazed, you know, high standard door compared to an average double glazed and so called high performance plastic door as it happened. So, yeah, th this gives you a graphic uh, representation of what, what the result looks like. And of course, the result is, you know, you're, you're being warmer, cozier, and living with lower bills in your building. So that's me done. Um, sorry for the, the breakneck dash through it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if we've got any time left for that. Yeah, Dermot, do you want to just stop sharing your screen a moment? I will do that, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. but I, I haven't come up on any screen, can't, can't be seen, just my name. I think um, I have stopped sharing, is that okay? Okay, yeah, we can see everyone. And okay, so if you have questions, for Dermot, please uh, do put them in the chat now. <clears throat> Annabelle saying that the sound is quite bad. Could if, if other people are experiencing that, could you just put it in the chat? Okay, question from Brian. Um, the thermal properties of PVC don't seem much worse than timber. Do the figures allow for the fact that PVC sections used on doors and windows usually contain a lot of air? Great question, so, uh, Brian. Um, and, and yet they don't, the figures that I quoted in that uh, table um, are purely the insulated property uh, or, or uh, insulation, insulative property of the material itself, not the fact that a typical UPVC window is 60 to 70 percent air, cold air at that. Um, so yeah, there's a tr there's around a 25 to 30 percent, depending on what the UPVC uh, resin formula is, about a 25 to 30 percent difference um, in the material itself. But 
you know, 50 to 60% when you take into account all the, um, the channels, the hollow channels in the window. Okay, um, just a quick one from uh, John. What was the per meter squared heat loss permitted for passive house? Just to uh, repeat that. Yeah, sure. So a, a passive house, um, a passive house uh, hole in your wall um, will, will be about one, uh, about the size of your credit card. Um, and the heat, the heat loss um, is expressed in terms of um, a particular formula, which I can paste on the, on the, um, on the chat in a little while, so you can see that. Um, but you know, heat loss is measured in terms of air pressure and number of air pressure cycles lost in a particular uh, a, a amount of time. Um, so I'll, I'll paste that. But generally, um, it, it's you know, it's it's around about eighty to ninety percent more exacting than a standard Part L building um, as of today. Okay, um, a couple of questions about materials. Um, do uh, um, insulation materials presumably uh, degrade over time and need replacing? Um, and then uh, what other materials are good for breathable wall insulation? Um, right, so breathable wall insulation um, has, ha a breathable wall needs to be built up of several elements, which starts with the plaster on the inside and the render on the outside. So everything that is there. So, for example, if you have a if you have a wall that's concrete rendered, um, you may find that it's already uh, a building that will not allow very much passage of of, of air, uh, excuse me, of, of moisture through through the fabric. Um, so um, ultimately, the, the short answer to your question is natural fiber materials. Um, if you can use a wood fiber type product, that is going to give you the best balance if you need to use something like a, uh, a rock wool or mineral wool type product that's also fairly good for passage of, of, uh, of moisture through um, but it, it, I just flag up the fact that the whole wall needs to be considered what's the plaster surface on the inside and what's the paint on the plaster on the inside because even that affects how the building will breathe uh, right through to the paint on the outside of the building on, on, the, uh, on the render if there is render, if it's brick, if it's, a, if it's a standard clay brick, it's already going to have a fairly good um, moisture passage capacity, as long as it's not been treated with some sort of a sealant, um, which is a, a tricky thing that sometimes happens. Okay, and I'm uh, sorry, John, did you answer the one about um, materials degrading and how long? I didn't, I didn't, no. So, um, so yeah, different materials will uh, degrade in different ways, depending uh, depending on where they are in the building and what, the, what, what, what they're surrounded with. So it's, it's too big a question to answer in, 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 in short. Um, I, um, I, I think that, that you know, it, it depends on atmospheric conditions. You know? so, so if you're talking about insulin on the inside, um, it's going to be less prone to, to, to suffering. But yes, there is, that this is something to bear in mind. And, and you should ask any supplier who's proposing a certain insulin, what kind of life time, what kind of life cycle is expected with that product? Okay, um, question from Anna. I'm having spray foam roof insulation done under the Greenhomes grant scheme. I looked at wall insulation, but didn't want my Edwardian house rendered. Do you have to have rendering with wall insulation? Uh, and then the second question, um, uh, when you read the blogs, they say that UPVC double glazing is more energy efficient than wood. So comments on that. Okay, so uh, three questions there. Um, I'll start with the easiest one. Um, any blogs you're reading about UPVC being more efficient um, than wood, uh, don't believe them. They're absolutely factually incorrect. Um, it is possible um, to, to use, um, uh, to build up uh, UPVC windows in such a way as they will perform um, slightly less badly than timber. But the fundamental physics of the equation um, are undeniable. And that is that there's a, a, a lambda value, a, a heat, heat, heat passage value with plastic, which is very different to wood. Um, so, so that's, you know, the first quick answer, because I could be here, you know, for an hour answering that question. Um, the second uh, point about your, the second question you raise uh, about um, solid wall insulation. No, you absolutely do not need to have 
uh, you're not you, the only cho you don't just have the choice of rendered external wall insulation you can use what's called brick slips which is essentially like tiles that get applied to the outside of the insulation to um, look as you know fairly similar to your original brickwork now there's no way I should say there is no way a weathered Victorian brick is going to look exactly um, similar to a new brick slip, a, a brick tile. But the effect of a brick elevation and how it looks and how it reads to the eye can be delivered through these brick slips. Um, so, so that's that one. Um, using spray foam roof insulation uh, is to my mind a very, a very potentially risky thing to do. I would never recommend doing it myself, um, but if you have been convinced um, by the people who are doing it that they know what they're doing and they, they can address questions around how your roof will continue to breathe after they've applied a non-breathable spray foam to the underside of your roof, um, then you may, you may wish to choose to go with them. But I, I always worry about foam being sprayed, especially to roofs, because normally what happens is they go into your loft and they just spray everything right up to the depth of the insulant, sorry, to the depth of the rafters. And that can cause significant airflow and breathability problems, which can in turn cause rotting of the timbers. So I would, I would tread very, very carefully um, doing that. Okay, thank you, Dermot. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, so, um, as well as the passive house standard, do you rate uh, using the Enerfit standard? Um, absolutely, Enerfit is is a really good um, practical way of trying to to um, to to, to uh, at, apply passive house standard to existing buildings. Because if you apply passive house new build standard to an existing building, uh, you're sort of doing the impossible. It's, it's just about impossible to do. Um, so the Enerfit is a, an, an evolution of the passive house standard for existing buildings. And it's um, still very onerous and, and difficult to achieve, but um, it's very much the right approach to take. Um, if if you can, you know if you're going down the whole house retrofit route, those are the standards you should you should aim for definitely. Okay, um, and so um, I think you've probably answered this one already. But do aluminium uh, frame windows and doors have poor thermal quality? Um, they absolutely do. Um, of the four materials that I spoke about um, that are typically used for windows and doors. Um, you know that as as a, i guess is to some degree common sense metal has the highest and fastest thermal conductivity of all of them um so when you are using aluminium um if you need to use it um you need to specify what's called thermally broken aluminium frames which basically means that they inject a layer of insulant um, inside the frames of both the sashes as well as the frames themselves of, of the window or the door. Um, so yeah, it, it's, and, and also from an in environmental impact point of view, it's, um, you know, it, it's pretty, pretty heavy. There's a huge amount of emissions involved. Um, and we have to hope that the market will evolve to the point where we can start using recycled aluminium in uh, aluminium windows, but there are very few manufacturers doing that um, at the moment. Um, so otherwise, yes, very high impact, um, environmental impact with, the, with those windows. Okay, thank you very much, Dermot, um, for um, your talk and answering all of those questions. Um, and we are now going to move on to Mike Ship, who is going to be, uh, he's from Carbon3, and he's gonna be talking about heat pumps. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll start. Um, have you have you shared your slides, Mike? 
Yep. Yeah, can you can you see that? Can guys? Can you see that? Not at the moment. Um, okay. Bear with me. We tried this on the practice session, and of course, it worked. <laughs> it worked, it worked. <laughs> Uh, I've had been, I have been having this problem. Um, yeah, a lot of people are only names, not faces. Huh. Including me, and I don't know how to get a face, how to turn it into a face. I, I don't want to... You got it, you go? Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Um, so basically, I'll give you a little intro to Carbon Free, um, the, the services we offer, and then we'll uh, we'll skip over that. We won't spend too much time on that. And then uh, we'll obviously go into um, air source heat pumps, the technologies around them, why there's a need for a change, and why we need to switch over to to, to more carbon efficient ways of heating our homes. Um, legislation and uh, and and the drivers behind how we're going to achieve that. Um, the future home standard, which is 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 a is one of those drivers, RHI and clean heat, uh, clean heat grant uh, funding streams, and then project delivery a little bit about how we deliver those projects and, and what you need to consider um, if you're thinking about um, installing this with heat pump. So um, carbon free was uh, um, established uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, we uh, we specialise in in all renewable technologies um, and. Uh, what we try to do is, is make sure that all the technologies that we fit work with one another. So um, we tend to find um, that obviously with, with, with solar PV um, and air source heat pumps, great technologies work together really well um, because PV generates electricity that ultimately gets used by the air source heat pump. So um, one of the things that we do really, really try hard to do is, is keep things simple so that the end users, um, the complexity around the system, it, it, isn't too much. Um, I mean, take a good look, a look at our website. I won't, I won't waste too much time going over all the technologies that we offer, but, but feel free to take a look. Um, so, SLC pumps, how they work, it's quite simple. It's, it's, it's not a new tech as such. Um, basically, energy for, from the air is taken. Um, into an evaporator uh, around the system uh, through a compressor um, into the condenser, um, which then um, essentially uh, pushes the heat um, from the air up um, into, into around about 35 to 40 degrees temperature, of which we then um, distribute out via um, standard methods of, of, of uh, heat transfer. So that may be uh, radiators, underfloor heating, um, and uh, hot water cylinders. This is a, a basic setup of a, of a SLC pump system. So you generally have an outdoor unit. Um, obviously that, that is the main part of the system that's, that's um, trans taking the heat and, and the energy from the air um, and, and pushing it up and pushing it through your building. That then goes into the traditional unvented cylinder. Um, one of the things that you need to bear in mind is uh, your water pressures. Uh, generally, we, we need to switch you over to unvented. Uh, that means you need to have a minimum of one bar of pressure. Um, it's not it's not always a be all and end all. Um, there are methods around that. So if needs be, we can fit pumps or um, accumulator sets, which, which can get your pressures up to what they need to be to achieve the system. Um, we can use traditional radiators um, and underfloor heating. One of the things to consider is when using traditional radiators, generally they need to be oversized by about 50%. Um, and the reason for that is uh, basically we're running at far lower temperatures to your traditional um, gas boiler system. Um, we generally run at around about 40 degrees. The lower the temperature, the better, because um, that, that essentially um, improves the system's efficiency. Um, so, so one thing to bear in mind, um, we have had a lot of calls in where other installers have been saying that you can keep 
your radiator is your existing radiators. That is sometimes true. Um, we, we, we do see that um, radiators are oversized a lot of the time, but just, just, just sort of um, be cautious with that um, and make sure that you receive heat loss calculations for each room um, to make sure that those radiators are suitable because essentially what you don't want to be do is, is be putting the, uh, the, 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 the main flow and return temperature on the system. You don't want to be putting it past sort of 45 degrees because you're going to reduce um, the efficiency of the system. Um, so why don't it change? Um, 40% of the UK emissions come from households. So um, I think Dan, Dan rightly said that earlier. Um, yeah, that is probably about 30% across the UK, but in London, we are, we are um, unfortunately, we are in the, one of the main areas that's affected. Um, I think that's around about 50, 60% uh, of the emissions come from our, from our households. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a, a need for change, obviously with climate change, um, we, we need to push on and we need to, we need to switch over um, to, to more carbon friendly ways of heating as soon as possible. Um, and air source heat pumps uh, are one, one of those methods. Um, so these, this, this, uh, this chart here uh, basically represents um, the, the benefit an air source heat pump has in terms of carbon. So um, we can see here that over the last few years, we've, we've done quite well um, as a nation in that we've reduced the amount of carbon in the unit of electricity. Um, now that's continuing to drop with, with, with wind and, and PV um, and, and other sources, um, but uh, we still got a little way to go. But what that means essentially is that by using electricity to heat um, your home is no longer um, as carbon intensive as it used to be. Uh, so we, we're, we're making good ways um, towards uh, reducing our, our, our carbon footprint in, in terms of heating by a resource heat pump. Um, we're probably going to skip over this slide because it's very much similar to what we just discussed. Um, one of the main things that, that, I won't, that I won't skip over on this one is, is the COP. So the COP is the coefficient of performance and generally that is what the ratio that we use in order to see how efficient an air source heat pump is. We generally see um, that for every unit of electricity that we, we put into an air source heat pump, we get approximately three or four back. Um, so when you compare that to a gas boiler in terms of costs, um, you'll see this in later slides, it brings the, the, the cost of your heating system, um, the running cost down considerably. So this, this um, chart represents uh, the carbon intensity um, and the progress that we're making um, and, and what we're, we're looking to see in the future. So. Um, you can see here that um, in 2012, well, SAP 20 self rep represents um, that the heat pump was 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 um, not too far behind a, a gas boiler in terms of the carbon intensity during its running and during its operation. Um, you can see here that uh, the heat pump is it, it, it's, it's getting better. Uh, SAP 10 um, obviously represents that, and uh, gas boilers will eventually be be we drop that in 20. Well, 2025 on new developments. Um, so yeah, um, the cost of heating. So at the minute, we can see here that um, heat pumps and, and gas boilers are essentially um, on par with one another now. Um, direct electrics, obviously, still very expensive. Um, but yeah, heat pump and uh, and gas boilers are around about the same operational costs. Um, but um, with, with various grants and, uh, and obviously the carbon benefit um, makes more sense now to, to, to go down the SLT on road. Um, this is a, a forecast of, of where we see the market going. So at the, at the moment we're in around about the 250 installation mark. Um, with the with various government legislation and whatnot, we're starting to see now that that we're really um, we're really taking off in terms of how many heat pumps are installed per annum. Um, and with the with the green home scheme, um, we anticipate that to to push on. And as you can see, um, twenty thirty, we're looking to be up at sort of two and a half million installations. Um, 
Uh, running costs, so we, we touched upon this earlier, uh, coefficiency of performance. You can see here we put in one kilowatt of electrical power. We take 2.2 from, from the um, renewable heat energy recovered from the environment, from the air that we're, we're running through the heat pump. Um, and that gives us an output of around about three to four kilowatts. Um, so one kilowatt in, four kilowatts out. Um, this slide uh, depicts um, operational costs. So um, we can see here um, that the, the SLC pump, if we, if we based it on a, a unit of electricity taken from the grid, around about 14 p per kilowatt hour, um, we're seeing here with a system efficiency of 3.5, the delivered cost is at, at 4.52 p, um, which uh, is, is just slightly cheaper than gas, although um, we are seeing that gas prices are coming down. Um, so we, we do have clients that generally have a, a gas price that is slightly cheaper than, than the SLC pump. Um, although one of the things that, that, that I touched upon earlier, um, solar PV working with, a, with an air source heat pump um, makes for, the, for, for even cheaper running costs. Um, so I think other technologies with this system is, is definitely a plus. Um, so EPC 2030, um, EPCs, I mean, we, we need to in, increase um, EPCs. We're going to start to see legislation moving on quickly, I think, um, and um, basically it's going to become more, more difficult to, to sell your home, lease your home, rent your home, um, if your EPC level is, is below a D, uh, well, below a D I'd say. Um, I'm currently in the process of moving now and, uh, and I'm seeing that. So, I'm looking at an SLC pump for my own property. <laughs> so the future home standards. Um, this is this is due to come come in. Uh, well, it's still in consultation. Um, it's something that that uh, we see keep changing, but um, we're, we're making good progress. Uh, 2019 spring statement introduced by FHS to the public. By 2025, uh, homes are to be future proof with low carbon heating and world leading levels of energy efficiency. Uh, a new home built to future standards is expected to be 75 to 80% lower um, than, than uh, current CO2 um, regulations. In order to start progress towards this goal, it is, it is proposed an uplift to Part L will be, will be delivered in 2020. Um, so we're starting to hopefully see that come through. The, the average cost to increase this, so this is quite key, um, is two thousand eight hundred seventy pounds. Um, so this is mainly for new build developments. One of the one of the things that in this consultation we're seeing is that um, the main focus is going to be on on fabric to start with. Um, so. Um, believe it or not, air source and and, uh, and, and renewables is, is not not going to be one of the key things at the moment. Although we are seeing that um, the government has, has mentioned additional steps um, that go beyond this, uh, and then we'll see solar PV coming in with with with, um, with air source heat pumps. So the green home green home grant scheme. Um, so, Homeowners landlords in, in England will be able to apply for vouchers. Um, I think there's been a lot of, a lot of discussion with loads, of, loads going on in the press with this. Um, two thirds of the cost of upgrading the energy efficiency of your home. So you'll get up to two thirds, uh, up to a maximum of, of £5,000. Um, households and low incomes will be eligible for 100% um, funding up to a maximum of £10,000. Um, the, the way the scheme works is, uh, you'll be eligible, like I say, for £4,000. Um, that, that's for a primary measure of which an SLC pump falls under a primary measure. So um, if, if you qualify for that, uh, then you, you can get up to £4,000 um, free towards installation. Secondary measures, um, there's an option of another £5,000. Um, again, it, it's two for, up to two um, thirds of the cost. The, the thing with vessel seat pumps, they are RHI eligible. So one of the things to consider with this is um, 
the RHI will basically be offset by the by the green home fund. So if your RHI, your renewable heat incentive works out to be say £6,000 over a seven year term, the £4,000 will be deducted from that um, and you will get £2,000 over the seven year term. So uh, the green homes grant scheme doesn't make a huge difference because the RHI is still um, going to be in place for a while anyway. So if you miss the Green Homes Grant Scheme, don't, don't fear, uh, there's, there's um, still time to get onto the RHI. Um, no heat incentive, uh, so like I said, over seven years, um, 10.85p per, uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, one of the key things to make sure is that your installer is MCS approved um, and uh, and that the RHI application is, is, is done correctly. Um, make sure that um, they're also uh, trust mark registered. Mike, do you have uh, lots more slides or um, if you can try and close in about yep. 10 minutes, that'd be good. Yep, no worries. Um, so I'll skirt through some of these. So this, this is the, the application installation. So you see here um, on the outside of the building, we have the, the air seat pump down at low level to the left. Um, generally downstairs on a new build property, it'd be under floor heating, but it, like I said earlier, it does work with radiators um, and generally just need to be 50% oversized. Um, and pipe work, et cetera, is very uh, similar to that of a, of a, of a boiler, gas boiler. Um, one thing to, to bear in mind is that the outdoor unit um, can be noisy. Uh, efficiencies and, and noise levels have got a lot better over the last few years. So what we see is um, they can be sited in areas that weren't so, um, uh, weren't, wasn't very normal um, to see. But now we're seeing that you can install these um, up to one metre um, away from an, an adjoining property. We have to get, complete some, some uh, noise assessments, but generally we, we, it's something to bear in mind. You don't really want to install them um, adjacent uh, habitable rooms, such as bedrooms, etc. cetera. Um, when they're installed, they should be on vibration pads, uh, insulated pipe work. Um, just one of, the, one of the biggest things that we see is the insulation, um, is obviously key to whether or not the, the system works efficiently and also ongoing maintenance costs. So um, just make sure you pick a, a reputable installation company. Um, and, and that's it. Um, any questions? Okay, if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, Mike, that would be great. Thank you very much for, for that. I've certainly learned some stuff. So a uh, number of questions. Um, right. From uh, from Ben, um, so a few here. So, what's the return of, on investment on a air source heat pump? Um, what's the yearly maintenance cost, and what is the system lifetime? Um, so, on if we if we use a, a, a free bed uh, semi, RHI roughly you get, you're going to get around about six thousand pounds over the seven year term. Um, that's that's sort of an approximate figure. It does it does depend on um, on various things like the size of the home, et cetera, but, but that's roughly where you are. Um, in terms of maintenance costs, um, very much um, similar to that of a, of a gas boiler. Um, although the maintenance costs, um, they, they generally, they, they're sort of, most of the parts on, on a ground source heat pump don't generally go wrong. So um, yeah, the, the, the maintenance cost is not too dissimilar to that of a, of a gas boiler. And the system lifetime? System lifetime, um, well, like I said, there's not much to go wrong. We, we, we anticipate system life, lifespans between 15 and 20 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, how much noise do they generate? You touched on that a bit. Um, E.g., if you're sitting outside nearby, can you hear them? Um, not, no, not the newer ones now, um, really low, really low, sort of down at, I think it's about around about three decibels. Uh, I need to, I'd have to check that, but um, definitely um, we, you'd need to complete a, uh, the installer has to complete um, as part of the MCS accreditation standards, um, a noise assessment. 
So um, that's why I was saying earlier, it's really important to pick a, a, an MCS accredited installer to ensure that the heat pump is installed in a position that's not gonna, gonna, gonna be a nuisance um, to you or your neighbors. Okay, um, another question. Uh, we have a Worcester Bosch Green Skies boiler. Can an air source heat pump be integrated with this system or would we be looking at a fresh install? Um, I'd need to check that. I think the Green Skies boiler is compatible with solar thermal. Um, so it, it probably is compatible with air source heat pump, although the idea of an air source heat pump really is we want to move away from, from the gas um, to, to obviously reduce carbon emissions. Yeah. Because there are things that like bivalent, is it bivalent where you yeah. can hybrid, yeah. you can have both the, yeah. the gas boiler and the air source heat pump working together with the gas boiler acting as a backup. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, Brian asks, um, for the bigger radiators, do you also have to change the pipe work, i.e. replumb the whole heating system? Um, and do you have any knowledge or experience of air to air heat pumps? Are they any good? Yep, so um, on the pipe work side, uh, yeah, we don't generally have to change too much of the, of the pipe work. Um, most of the time we, we can use the existing pipe work, although we do sometimes see that the primary pipe work, so the pipe work from the boiler to the cylinder, um, sometimes needs to be increased from, from the, the standard size is 22 millimeter pipe work, we, we'd increase it to 28 millimeter. Um, what was the uh, and um air to air yeah, yeah we 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 install air to air heat pumps um very similar to an air conditioning unit um but provide heating as well so we we've got a few installs at the moment work work really well okay and then just a last question um have you experienced any issues with legionella as heat pumps have lower temperatures um we I must admit, I've never experienced a, a case of Legionella, although we do combat it. Um, the systems that we install, uh, we, we basically set the system to um, heat itself up to 60 degrees uh, via the immersion heater. Um, so like I was saying earlier, most of the systems that we install um, are, are generally with PV as well. So um, if you can time that um, correctly um, in the, you, you want to use your, your free energy from the PV system to, to top your, your system up to protect you against Legionella. It's, it's essentially free um, and, and uh, you're obviously topping your water up to 60 degrees. Most of the SLC pumps now as well can achieve 60 degrees. Um, so um, you can combat it via the heat pump. It, it's not a, a be or an end all. You don't have to do it by the immersion. Okay, and actually just a final question from Dermot. Um, Mike, can you explain the importance of reducing the heat demand um, uh, through insulation to allow cost-effective use of an air source heat pump as per your explanation of the internal temperature differences? Yes, so essentially what, what you want to do is, insulation is always the first step. Um, if you can bring, if you can bring a, the, the, your, your heat demand down, obviously you're going to reduce, um, you're going to reduce the running cost of the air source heat pump, the size of the air source heat pump. Um, and, uh, and then ultimately that makes it more cost effective. Um, definitely insulation are, are, is always the first step. If, if um, I'd say, uh, for the green home scheme. Um, if you have an opportunity to, to use that scheme, insulation will probably be the best, the, the, the first thing you want to do. Um, and then look at the heat pump. Um, although it, they're both primary measures, um, I'd say insulation is definitely the first one. Um, and then, yeah, if, you, if you're lucky enough and any property suitable air source heat pumps, that is, is, I'd say the next solution. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that's really good. Uh, we're now going to move on to our third speaker, um, and that's uh, John Cowdrill from Joju Solar. And John is going to be talking about uh, solar and talking about batteries and also uh, electric vehicle charging points. So over to you, John. Hey, uh, thank you. All right, let's see if this works. Uh, okay. Yeah, all right. Can you see that okay? Yeah, perfect. Lovely. All right, yep. Yeah. My name's John. Um, I work at Joji Solar. 
and a little bit of introduction about Joju. So we do commercial, residential, public sector. Um, been around since 2006. And, uh, but yeah, I focus on residential. So uh, people, generally people who own their own homes or um, that kind of thing, I suppose, or building their own homes. And we can retrofit onto existing houses like this one here, which happens to be my house. Um, or we can work on plans, doing a development like a block conversion or an extension or a new build. Or if you've just got a big field, you want to put some solar panels in, you can do that as well. Um, I was going to rattle through, or I'd like to rattle through the sort of standard types of solar panels. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but um, I thought I'd recap. So you've got a, something like this, which is your traditional on roof. 90% uh, of uh, solar arrays will be something like this. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Um, same kind of thing, but what's what we've seen is quite popular are all black solar panels. So if your solar array faces the street, your neighbours can see it, you might want it to be a bit more subtle so you can go for like an all black look like that. Um, they are slightly less efficient than a traditional panel that has a white back sheet. So um, you kind of, yeah, but I think, but not much. We're, talk, we're talking like fractions of a percent. So um, I think it's actually worth doing if it's very prominent and you don't want to, you want it to look good, so your neighbours are likely to do it as well. We do see that as well. If you if, if a solar array goes in, it looks good, then you find all the neighbours end up doing it eventually. So that's quite a good thing to do. Um, and what we've seen is very popular over the last few years is in-roof solar. So instead of the panels being over the top of the tiles, they're, they're sort of embedded into the roof. Um, very popular with new builds, renovations, it saves your slates. Uh, so you, you don't have slates here. Um, under the panels, um, reduces the amount of weight on the roof. Um, and I suppose it looks a little bit less intrusive, so that's pretty popular too. Um, and flat roof um, installations, uh, we tend to use this kind of mechanical fix. Um, again, it keeps the weight down, so we're not imposing that much load on the roof. Um, and yeah, that's flat roof. And last but not least, uh, a couple of examples of solar slates. So this top one you, you hear about a lot in the press, it's the Tesla uh, so slates, not available in the UK yet, probably will be in the next five years some, at some point. Um, interesting what, what's happened with Tesla, I don't know if you can see, but they've just got bigger and bigger because I think they noticed that when they were producing these very small slates that look like conventional slates at the cost a kilowatt peak was so expensive. So they've kind of um, evolved to these kind of quite big um, slates, which they're installing in reasonable numbers in the US at the moment. Uh, I suppose that'll eventually come to come here. But if you wanted something um, that is available already, um, a company called GB Soul makes the solar slates in the UK already and they have done for years. Um, so, um, so you can get it. Um, yeah, with both of these things, they're a bit more expensive than a conventional solar panel, but um, if you've got a sensitive building, it could be a listed building or something that's very prominent, then uh, solar slates definitely worth considering. Um, so that's that. Uh, while we're on, uh, I suppose, the look of the array, um, I've got a slide here on uh, permitted development. So generally speaking, solar is permitted development, even if you're in a conservation area. Um, and even if the panels face the street. So um, the planning is very supportive of solar panels. Um, there's a, a few caveats to that mind. So if there's an article four in your concept, if, if you're in a conservation area and there's an article four, then there's no permitted development rights. So if you're concerned that the solar might not be allowed, you can contact your planning department and ask if there's an article four that strict solar panels, uh, but it's quite rare. It tends to be sort of areas with particular historical interest that have article fours. Um, and last of all, if you live in a listed building, then you, you definitely need listed building consent and planning permission. Uh, so there you go. Um, so in general, we can design solar to start with from, um, from a desktop using Google Earth, plans, that sort of thing. 
we normally want to um, come and do a site visit at some point, although during the pandemic, we've been doing remote site surveys. I think a lot of people have been doing that. Um, so we've got an option if we can either come and visit or we can, we can talk you through doing your own site survey for us. <laughs> um, anyway, to start with, we often use Google Earth um, and it's surprisingly accurate. We find it's right to about 10 centimeters. It's phenomenal, really. Um, and then you can produce these sort of 3D models of panel layouts um, to get a feel for what it'll look like. Um, it's worth noting the solar doesn't have to be all south facing. You can use east and west as well. It'll generate a little bit less, about 80, 85% across the year, but um, it's still worth considering in a lot of cases. And, and yeah. we'll do some more drawings um, and then produce um, your predictions. So, um, uh, yeah, um, based on the orientation, local weather, shading, that sort of thing. We find these are right to within about 6%. Uh, it could go up and down according to the weather year to year, to year. but generally it's, yeah, it, it varies day to day, week to week, but across the year, it, it's pretty stable. You know, we get it within about 6%, as I say. Mm. So we're often asked, how much solar should I fit? Um, and there's different design strategies for how much solar you should have. And I suppose the first one that you, um, you can think about is whether you just want the fastest rate of return on your investment. Um, and if that's the case, um, you kind of want to go for a moderate size solar array. You don't want to go too big. Um, and that's because you're, well, I suppose moderate compared to your usage, because if you, you can use a lot of your solar because you don't earn as much as you used to through, through the feed-in tariff. The savings really come from savings on your bill. So actually having a moderate size solar array and not spending that much up front is arguably quite a sensible thing to do. Um, you don't export that much to the grid and you'd probably go for a, like a budget solar panel. That's one way of looking at it. Um, another way um, is um, well, uh, in a context of uh, generous design, so I recently read this book, um, Donut Economics, and uh, it was talking about how to combat climate change, we need to sort of design our houses and our cities generously so that they, um, they produce more energy than they use and export to um, people around us. And that's going to be a really good way to, to sort of get us out of this climate mess. So. The other way of looking at it is to actually go for maximum environmental impact. Um, <clears throat> so to do this, you kind of want to go for the largest solar array that your roof can accommodate um, sensibly without it looking bonkers, um, and then maximize the yield. Um, if you do that, you're going to have the highest levels of self-sufficiency, um, but you're also going to generate way more than you can use. You're going to export loads of power to the grid, which uh, effectively your neighbors are going to use. Um, and to do that, you'll probably go for high efficiency solar panels. They're going to cost more, uh, but they'll also last a really long time. So probably 40 years plus for a top end high efficiency solar panel. So there's sort of two different ways of looking at it. So um, here's a couple of slides showing generation and consumption. This is, this is my house. Um, on this left, on the left access access here, you've got kilowatt hours, um, and actually the the levels are different. This is five hundred kilowatt hours. This is two hundred and fifty kilowatt hours. So actually, this one should be down here, really, if they were the same. But what you can see is through most of the year, you generate. Well, um, yeah, we're generating here more than we use. It's only really November, December, January wasn't installed at that point. But January and February, where we're using more than we generate. You've got this big chunk here, um, which is all exports to the grid. Um, so yeah, and then the, the problem we've got is we, you know, we just use it, we're just generating much more than we can use. Um, it's sort of a problem, it sort of isn't a problem. So I'll come back to that. Um, oh yeah, so there's no batteries here, um, but we could. To get some batteries. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we've been installing batteries since 2012. Uh, we've got some Tesla power walls there and some Sonnens. We also do a lot of LG Chem 
and not much else actually. It's mostly Tesla Sonnen and LG Chem. Uh, we've dabbled with a few other cheaper ones, but I've not got on with them. So uh, I tend to stick to these ones, which are, I suppose, even more high end ones. Uh, that's that. Um, it's worth watching um, Fully Charged. There's a lots of good videos on Tesla Power too. Um, so have a little nosy there. Um, yeah, I mean, Tesla's our, our most popular battery. Um, it now does grid backup. So if there's a power cut, it's still got power. Um, and the solar will still generate when there's a power cut. So you can top up your battery with your solar, for, you know, effectively be off grid for quite an extended period of time. You do get some batteries that you can just discharge the batteries, but you can't charge them up from the solar. So, so yeah, so that's quite nice. Um, yeah, it's very flexible. Um, you, we can fit it inside or outside. Um, and you can have like long cable runs about up to about 50 meters from where the battery is to where the meter is, which is quite useful. With some low voltage batteries, you don't have that flexibility. Um, and yeah, a typical house can run about 75% from solar and battery. Um, the last 25% you could basically run from a cheap nighttime rate. So um, in the winter when you don't have that much solar, it's, it's, the days are so short, basically, you can charge your battery from the cheap nighttime rates and run your house from that, quite nice. And Tesla being Tesla um, are constantly updating their batteries firmware. So we're getting lots of new functionality. So they are now doing weather predictions in their sort of nighttime charging regime. So it think if it knows it's going to be or it thinks it's going to be sunny the next day it won't charge the battery as much from the cheap nighttime rates um, so basically you're always well you're more likely to have um, capacity in the battery to charge it from the solar which is cheaper than charging it on the cheap nighttime rate basically um yeah okay <laughs> yeah i mean this they, they are big beasts so the the high storage capacity they're suited to a sort of your larger house um, I kind of think um, if we were going to have them sort of, I suppose, with more conventional houses, you'd need about one of these every three houses. I think you could probably stabilise the grid enough, make it work quite nicely. Um, and to facilitate that, um, well, part of the solution is um, virtual power plants and um, using the grid storage as well as the battery and, and having distributed storage if you see what i mean and you can now get a tesla energy tariff um, there are two different types um, if you've got a tesla car um, solar and a battery you can get an 8p per kilowatt hour import and export rate which is extremely competitive i mean 8p per kilowatt hour import rate is kind of half the going rate at the moment and 8p exports is well over the rest, like the, the nearest competition, which is 5.5 pence a kilowatt hour. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, but if you don't have a Tesla car, um, you can get an 11p import and 11p export rate, um, which depends on how much energy you use, but it could be better because obviously your export rate's better. So if you're a low energy user, that's actually better. <laughs> um, and it's really good if you've got high winter electricity use. So you guys, uh, so Mike fitting heat pumps, you can basically use this summer energy, export it to the grid, get paid 11p and import it back in winter at 11p for the same price. Just with one battery, it's, it's nuts. <laughs> I think it's game changing, man. So um yeah very exciting times uh, basically being able to store energy through the grid from season to season um mm -hmm. so yeah very excited about that um we've done some analysis about so octopus energy who are yeah pretty popular at the moment with our customers for their funky um funky tariffs and things like that you can get sort of variable um tariffs that track the wholesale sale prices of electricity. Um, they've got a very good tariff called Octopus Go, where you, um, 
you can buy energy at night time for five pence between midnight and 4.30 in the morning. Um, so our customers are going, well, is it best to go on this te Tesla energy tariff or Octopus Go? And we kind of thought, well, it's probably best to go for Tesla energy, the Tesla energy tariff, which all, incidentally is also for Octopus. So it's all for Octopus, but one's for Tesla and one isn't. Um, we thought it'd be better to go with the Tesla one if you use a lot more than the capacity of the battery a day. But actually, we found Octopus Go was better um, for most people, particularly if you use quite a lot of energy. So between like five megawatt hours to 15 megawatt hours a year. And that's much more than your daily cycle of energy is much more than the battery capacity. What we think is happening is you're charging up at the cheap nighttime rate you're discharging that up till mid morning. The solar's then topping up the battery again, and then you're then discharging in the evening um, with the power wall. So you're getting two cycles of the battery. So actually, Octopus goes Octopus goes better um, for a lot of customers. Uh, it's when you get down to these lower levels when you when you generate a lot more than you use, then you're best off with that Tesla tariff because you're exporting so much power and you're earning money for it. There you go. Um, yeah, this was this, this graph is basically a um, matrix of cost. Uh, so these positive numbers is actually cost, and this is credits. Um, and oh no, hang on a sec. That's what this is here cost, credit. But basically, if you take the cost, the yearly running costs of the Tesla energy plan minus the cost of Octopus Go, that's this graph here. So this is where Octopus, oh no, this is Octopus, <laughs> sorry. Um, Octopus Go is a, is a better bet here, these green numbers. And then the Tesla Energy Plan is better here. I could talk you through this. <laughs> um, there we go. If you're not confused now, then you will be. No, I'm joking. Um, I'll come back to that. Yeah, ask, ask me if you, if you didn't understand that. I'm kind of slightly confused myself. Um, sure, anyway. just, just two or three minutes more. Thanks. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you for saving me there. Um, <laughs> um, we install a lot of these Zappy chargers. So uh, basically, um, it's, it's a car charger, um, uh, but the innovation is that you can alter the charge rate depending on um, how much spare solar capacity you've got. So you can either give it a fast charge at seven kilowatts single phase or 22 kilowatts three phase. And uh, that's fine. Or if you're not in a rush, you can set it to eco mode and it'll only use spare solar capacity. Um, so generally, you're not really in a mad rush to charge your car because your car capacity is huge nowadays. So you just need to top it up every now and again. So that works really well. Um, yeah, that's that. Oh, yeah. And if you don't have a driveway, I'm really excited about this sort of connected curb thing. Um, so you could run a cable to your curb to charge your car um, and if you don't have an electric car you could still fit one and charge other people to charge our, their cars and off solar which is amazing um, so yeah that's kind of it um, and this is what we do we just literally do solar batteries and using charge points that's kind of it any questions thank you very much john um yeah do you want to go back Perfect. I, I've seen some questions coming up. Um, so, um, right. So first question, um, is there any point in looking at getting solar panels on a shed three metre by five metre south facing without a high roof pitch? Three metre by five metre. Um, yeah, I think you could get, it could be fit on that. It could fit about four panels. It's, it's borderline. Um, I mean, you could you could always have just one panel, but four panels is is all right. Um, the thing is, you've got to consider you know what the cable connections are like. If it's if there's not a sub fuse board in the shed, um, then you pro you probably need some trench work back to the house to connect it to something. Um, but yeah, it'd be worth looking at definitely. You'd send me a if it's a low angle, that's not the end of the world. You just need some drainage, so you probably need ten degrees. That'd be fine. Um, and yeah, we need to consider what the roof construction is, that kind of thing. So uh, it's worth, worth hanging a, something over, definitely. Okay, 
Thank you. Um, another question, can panels be applied on vertical or horizontal surfaces? And you talked a bit about flat roofs, but maybe perhaps the vertical surfaces could be. Mm -hmm. You can, yeah. Um, in conservation areas, you need planning permission um, and you're only going to be generating 50 to 60 percent of what a nice angled south facing array would generate. Um, so yeah, and it, and it so yeah, it really wants to be facing towards the south. It, it won't generate as much. But yeah, it's quite common. Um, for flat, for horizontal, you just need a bit of drainage. You just need like a little bit of, of so otherwise you get sediment build up, and 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 it gets quite, the panels get quite mucky. But just a little angle for water drainage would be fine on flat roofs. Okay, um, and a question from uh, Ben sounds like he might have been burnt uh, a bit by an uh, installation. Is there any redress for historic installation as generation dropped at least 25% after one year? Ooh, that's surprising. Are they flat? Have you got, is there pigeons or squirrels or foxes or something like that have got on the roof? 25% uh, is quite extreme after one year uh, for it to go down. It, 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 yeah, that is extreme. If, I'm guessing the company's not still around that fitted them. Um, but you, they, you, it's quite common to get um, workmanship warranty insurance. Um, so there should be something through, uh, through that. You could probably contact RECC or even, or even just send something to Jojo and we can have a look through our maintenance, see if there's anything, maintenance department, see if there's anything obvious that could be causing it. Um, it. It really seems like a tree's grown up or something's happened that, that was unexpected to, to cause that drop off. Okay, a uh, question from Kate. Do PV systems really feed back to the grid? <laughs> yeah, definitely, 100%. I mean, there's only, so this is, there's only one cable, unless you've got three phase that comes into your house. So um, if you're generating more than you use, which is most of the time, uh, particularly on a sunny day, it's quite hard to use all that power. It has to go somewhere. It literally can't go nowhere. So it has to go to the grid. Um, if you're off grid, um, you'd normally have a battery. So that would, the solar would fill up a battery. Once the battery's full, the solar would have to ramp down production and stop producing as much so that, you know, the energy has to go somewhere basically. So it definitely feeds the grid. Okay, and then uh, just a last question, um, just to confirm, to clarify, solar panels can be installed in conservation areas on roofs facing the street. So if you could just clarify that, John. Yep, 100%, yeah, they can, yeah, under yep. permitted development. Okay, thank you very much, John, um, brilliant. Um, I am now going to do the next presentation, uh, that's me, um, and I'm gonna be talking about smart meters and actually it's gonna fit in quite well with what everyone else has been talking about, I think. Uh, I, mine will be a bit shorter, you might be pleased to know. Um, so I will share my screen now. Okay. Um, so, um, I have been following um, the smart meter rollout for the last uh, six years or so. Um, so, um, and I actually did a presentation on this uh, for MHSG about four years ago. So, it was really interesting to look back on those slides and see how things have changed and how they haven't changed. Um, and I also became the proud owner of my own smart meter uh, last month. So, I can talk a little bit from experience, having played with the thing a bit. Um, so, um, what I'm going to cover, uh, so what is a smart meter, what the rollout plans are in the UK, uh, the interactive home display or IHD, uh, the installation process, what you go through, uh, will it save you energy, um, what about switching suppliers, uh, future uses, and then a bit about health warnings um, and whether they're necessary. Um, so what is a smart meter? Um, so that's a picture of the meter itself as opposed to the um, IHD. Um, and that is what will replace your existing meters. It meters both gas and electricity. Um, and it communicates with suppliers, with your energy supplier over a national network. And it can send either daily readings or half hourly readings. Um, and you can also get tariff information from your supplier, e.g. Um, uh, cheap off-peak rates. Uh, John was talking a bit about that, and I'm going to come on to that a little bit uh, in a moment. Um, so in terms of the rollout, uh, so it all started 
or probably about 10 years ago now, a good long time ago. It had a very slow uh, ramp up period. Um, they had to replace 53 million meters. Uh, so a lot of meters um, and that is homes and also small uh, businesses as well uh, at a cost of 11 billion pounds. Uh, so pretty big program. Um, and the end date was to be the end of this year, but then um, COVID struck and they've, they've moved the date out to 30th of June 2021. It has to be said, they are quite away behind their um, target. They're at the 21 million smart meters installed to date. So whether they'll, I doubt very much whether 53 million will be installed. There will be some that will be in difficult to install homes or people that they don't want them, probably not that many of them, uh, but they probably won't get to the 53 million by the 30th of June 2021, but that, that is their target. Um, so, um, and why, so what's the point? Why are they doing it? So um, partly so that there's no more manual meter reading, which was expensive in terms of people coming around to read the properties and people not bothering to read their meters and being charged incorrectly, etc. So and there's a huge saving to utility companies, 8 billion to 2030. So kind of partially offsets that cost of install. Um, Second main reason that you'll make energy use visible to consumers. So the idea being that if you can see the, your energy use, see when your, your, your really goes up or when it goes down, uh, that you can actually change your behaviour to start um, uh, saving money on your bills. And uh, I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on as to how much of that has actually been seen. Um, and then, um, and this really links into what John was talking about, smart meters are a central part of the smart grid. Uh, and that's going to reduce the, the costs of providing energy in the future. And I'll, I'll talk more about that too. So um, interactive home display. So this is the thing that will uh, that, that, that will sit on your kitchen uh, surface or, or in your hall. It comes with the smart meters. It is linked to the smart meters, but not via your Wi-Fi. It's linked via um, the, uh, its own network. Um, and it will show you real time the amount of gas you're using and the amount of electricity you're using. Usually they will show you both kilowatt hours with units of energy or the cost. Um, and you should be able to see it um, per day, over the last week, over the last month. Um, and you can also uh, um, link to an app uh, on your phone. So that's the one I've got, which is Smart Things. And that just allows you to check on your phone how much you're using, how much it compares to your average use, etc., rather than having to, um, to look at the, the, the display. Um, so in terms of the installation process, uh, so Smart Meter GB are the organisation that are um, coordinating the overall rollout um, and different energy suppliers are rolling out at different times. Um, so it, it's um, some, some are ahead of others um, and you'll usually what will happen is you'll get an email or call from your energy supplier and they'll say we're, we're installing Smart Meters in your area, can we now do uh, make an appointment to install. Um, you or another adult must be there for the whole installation time, uh, usually um, between an hour and two hours. Um, uh, which you, you, just, you, you should be at your home, in your home at that time. And the meters will go in the same place as your current meters. They have to follow a code of practice when installing. Um, and just in, in capitals here, they aren't compulsory. You can say uh, that you don't want a smart meter. Um, it's um, worth noting as well, during COVID, uh, they, as I said, um, uh, they, they actually stopped the smart meter install altogether uh, for um, about two or three months. They, they've been started, as they've started up in summer, they've been, been ramping up, but the installation is a little bit different in that they now try and minimise the interaction with the homeowners. So before they would have, as part of the code of practice, provided you some energy efficiency advice, and they're not doing that now. They leave you a leaflet, but they don't actually give you that. That, that advice themselves. Um, so um, will it save, save me money? So there've been various studies on this. There was a lot of detailed studies done in 2016 and a few more uh, recently. And they've, I think, said pretty much the same sort of thing. So that a two to 3% um, average bill saving uh, has been seen. Um, and a, um, a recent survey said around three quarters of people with smart meters uh, report taking at least um, one energy saving actions. Uh, things like uh, reducing the amount of water in a kettle, switching off appliances, low energy bulbs. They're great for looking 
looking at um, what you might be leaving on overnight. So if you ch check the, um, uh, the IHD just before you go to bed, it really should be pretty low. It should just be your fridge on. Um, if you've got a lot of um, appliances that you're not actually switching off, like computer, TV, et cetera, then you're gonna find that is, is, is higher um, uh, than it needs to be. Okay, so um, what if you want to switch supplier? So this has been an issue in that what's happened in the past is that basically there were, there were two generations of smart meters. So the first generation is called, sometimes known as uh, SMETS-1. Um, uh, that was being installed up till about 2018, uh, maybe into a bit, just a few into 2019. And in fact, there may even be a few still being installed, although that really shouldn't be happening now. Then came along SMETS 2, um, which is the latest generation of smart meters. Now, the first generation was linked to the supplier that installs. And if you switch to another supplier and you've got that first generation of smart meter, they may become done. They may not or they may do. Um, now, the new generation. So if you get a smart meter installed now, you are very likely to get the second generation and that will work with any supplier. So if you switch supplier, it will still be smart. It will still work. Um, and by the end of next year, the energy companies need to enroll any of the dumb first generation smart meters onto the network so that they also can be used if you switch suppliers or to replace them with second generation smart meters. So there has been an issue with switching, but in the next year or so, that issue will, will go away. So looking to the future, um, so um, as uh, John alluded to, electricity can't easily be stored in the national grid. Um, obviously, things like batteries are giving you some options, but um, but largely you have to use it as it's as it's generated. So um, what's happened in the past is that if there's been a big peak load, um, so everyone's watching the Bake Off final or, or uh, the football match, whatever, what will happen is that the traditional power stations um, generation will be ramped up and they could ramp up fairly quickly and that just isn't the case with renewables you, you can't you can't do that and the picture here shows um uh, sort of typical household energy use so overnight this is the first early hours small hours of the morning not very much used eight o'clock uh everyone's going at seven o'clock eight o'clock everyone getting up boiling the kettle etc having a shower um it drops a little bit during the day and then really really peaks in the evening as everyone comes home they make their their their, their food uh they put their washing machine on they put the dishwasher on and 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 the, you know really goes high and then it starts dropping on, off again as you get later into the evening so how do you um, cope with these uh, with the intermittent renewables? So um, the idea is that um, if you can uh, encourage people not to use their appliances when demand um, uh, is very high, uh, then that will that will that will level things out. So you try and shift the demand, and so for example, you 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 change the price of electricity so that it's cheap at say 10 p.m. And that will encourage people to wait and put their dishwasher on at 10 p.m. rather than earlier. And you can actually now get smart appliances that, um, that, you, that you could actually uh, program to put on at that time. And will even eventually listen to what the pricing is. So through your smart meter, it'll say, right, the tariff is low, the price is low, I'm now going to switch on and do the dishes. So that way you, you win by getting a cheaper tariff and the grid wins by shifting that peak demand out of that really uh, uh, heavy four to 8 p.m. period and into the later period. And they reckon around eight to 10% of demand uh, could be shifted that way. Dishwashers, washing machines being the obvious ones, uh, some less obvious, so you know, probably not everyone's gonna want to move their cooking till, till 10 p.m. Um, and this, um, the, the kind of potential for this kind of um, uh, smart char charging, so smart use, that's just going to grow with electric vehicles, with home batteries and with heat pumps. So um, the idea being that your, um, uh, your, your, your charging point could, as, as John was saying, could listen to what the, um, what the price is of electricity when the price is low, it, um, uh, the electric vehicle charges. 
um, and, and, and it doesn't charge when the price is high. And that again avoids that peak. So, because what we don't want is everyone, once we've all got electric vehicles, they all start charging between four and 8 p.m. because otherwise the, 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 you'll have to build this really oversized electricity system to, to meet that demand. Um, so if you can shift that charging so that the cars charge overnight, then that will be um, definitely beneficial. And the same for heat pumps, because again, they're quite a big electricity demand. Again, if you can have them running uh, when you want the want when the, the price is a bit cheaper, then that's going to um, uh, be good for you as well. Um, and 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 Mike explained how you in terms of batteries where you can charge the battery uh, when when the price is, is low on the grid. Now all of this is kind of just beginning now. Um, and um, uh, Mike talked about the Tesla tariff. He also mentioned Octopus, uh, Ovo Energy also have their EV everywhere tariff. So so it's fast moving environment and we're going to see more and more of this as, as more people get smart meters then there are going to be these kind of uh, smarter tariffs uh, being offered um, by the energy suppliers um, so what about health and privacy concerns uh, I've just finished off on that and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a uh, quite a nice little video from which magazine which um, I think summarizes uh, the issues so if you can just bear with me, I'm just going to share another screen if I can find it. Um, sorry, just bear with me here. Oh, God. Slide up. Okay. Right. So if we go to that. Hopefully, can people see um, uh, smart meter myth debunked? Can you put your thumb up if you can see that? Brilliant. Okay. So I'm now just going to play that. Smart meters are designed to make the electricity system smarter and more flexible, giving you more control of your energy bills. Millions of households already have one but some are still sceptical. So let's set the record straight. Smart meters use radio waves to send automatic readings to your energy company. Despite health things, they actually emit less radiation than your smartphone. Based on evidence from thousands of scientific studies, experts say smart meters are no risk to your health. The latest generation of smart meters use a dedicated network to send readings, not your home Wi-Fi. The data they transmit is secure and encrypted. Older devices use a SIM card to communicate over mobile networks, which is less secure. There's no upfront charge for having a smart meter fitted but installation does come at a cost, with the rollout factored into the price of our bills, whether you have one or not. Automatic readings build a better picture of your energy usage, so if this information helps you change how much gas and electricity you use, in the long run, a smart meter could help save you money. Okay, um, so uh, that's it from me. Um, I would recommend um, looking at the uh, at which actually if you just search on which on uh, magazine smart meters, there's loads of really useful detailed information on there. But hopefully that's an overview. Um, so um, I'm just going to check whether there's any questions for me. Um, so one from Ben. Um, no more manual meter reading is a myth. We had first generation smart meters installed in 2010 and each supplier refused to take their own reading and we had many. Last week we installed the second generation and only one of the two managed to pair. So we're advised that we will have to keep on sending manual readings forever. Ah, yeah, what a pain. Uh, I mean, I think that there are some houses where it is difficult to install them. And I think it depends on where your meters are located um, uh, and whether the, the signal is gonna work. Um, so yeah, it's not a 100% solution. It's not gonna work in, in every home. 
Any other questions on smart meters? And I'm aware that everyone has been on this call for a very long time, so I fully understand if you're pretty tired by now. Shall I just round off, Cara? Yeah, sure. Um, just, just. Um, what was that a question? Yeah, a question, but not smart meter. Um, I'm interested in infrared panels for heating a small room. Right, that's probably not going to be me to answer. Anyone else, John, Mike or Dermot, can comment on infrared panels? Is that solar thermal? I mean, solar thermal definitely gets some power from infrared. I, I don't think so. I think these are the those sort of direct electric in yeah. panels that you can run, Mike. Yeah, did you know it's, anything about them? It's, yeah, it's, it's a it's an infrared heating panel, so um, it can work very similar to a uh, storage heater in that um, it's designed to heat the um, the building rather or, or objects rather than the ambient air. Um, so uh, it, it's quite efficient, um, but you it's it's not uh, it doesn't currently form. Um, or there's no grant available on the on, on that technology at the moment. And Mike, probably another question that you're probably better placed than me to ask answer, uh, which is that do, do smart meters read solar generation or, or John actually, um, and, and do they cover um, fit meters? So obviously you've got your feed in tariff um, generation meter. Do, do, will you carry on having that if you have a smart meter or can you replace them with a single meter? Mike, do you want that, mate? No, go on, go on John. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh, um, you can. We've we used to fit smart meters as standard for with generation meters, just so that people can read them remotely. But no, um, not not. It's not funded by the energy suppliers. They won't fit one for free now. So. Um, you'd like your installer could probably do something uh well we we could but there's like a data transfer cost so not, not really worth it i don't think unless you're renting out your house um and you can't get, get access to it then it's probably not worth it but otherwise you can but you'd have to read it remotely yourself and then pass on the readings <laughs> so so basically you'd end up with with two sets of meters so you'd have your generation meter and then you might have a smart meter separately as you could swap it you could swap your gen meter for a smart meter um but and then you'd have to sort of alter the um serial numbers with your feeding tariff supplier so it would be possible so i'd say it's but but it'd be a bit of a fiddle and yeah. and they'd be it would be quite expensive so it's only worth doing if you really can't get access to your meter uh, if you're if you're renting your house out for instance yeah okay um Right, and then Brian, just for the comments about infrared panels being good for heating the people in a small area in a big room. So That's exactly right. Yeah, they're designed to, to heat objects rather than, than large areas. So, yeah. yeah. Um, the, a company that we use, um, manufacturers called Herschel. Um, I'll, I'll put a link up on the, on the, on the chat here so that everyone can, uh, can, mm -hmm. can take a look. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay, okay. Um, Mary, do you want to wrap up? I just want to say a big thank you to all our wonderful speakers. Uh, thank you to Derma, to Mike, to John and to Cara. And please come back next Monday, the fifth and final event in our Green Homes online series. And it's hot tips for warm homes uh, with Tom Ruxton from The Heat Project. And I'll put the booking link on the chat. There's details also on our website on Green Homes Online. So thanks very much. Good night and stay warm. And um, thank you. Just one final word. If you've got any feedback for us on these events, on this event or the previous ones, do just drop it on the chat. It's really helpful for 